Lord be with you. We welcome you to our second Sunday after Easter worship from Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Cadillac, Michigan. A link for the service folder as well as online giving is on the church's webpage and the Facebook page. The webpage is emmanuelcadillac.org and then you can find Emmanuel's Facebook page also. We ask God's blessings on our time together under his word and spirit. Our opening hymn is hymn 463, Christ the Lord is risen today.
Psalm 105 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. He remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Gospel for this second Sunday of Easter is from John chapter 20, beginning with the 19th verse. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is with them. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hand the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand, and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God has made us his own people by our baptism into Christ. Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn 
487, Come You Faithful, Raise the Strength. Coronavirus, COVID-19, turned an ordinary event 
into something very strange, foreign, alien, and scary. And suddenly it wasn't just a Lenten choice to give up chocolate or movies or anything like that, but it was the world and its fear that had stolen our lives. We ended up giving up the ordinary chores as well as the little luxuries in life. Why well, that's not so true. We did not have a choice. Fear came rushing in to take them from us and promise that we might be safe enough if we gave up enough for long enough. And so sheltering in place, we huddled in our homes. We keep our distance from our friends and strangers alike. Our coming and our going is restricted, and daily we get the report of grim COVID-19 news. And along with this, we've also surrendered something else. We've given up the comfort of God's house and the gathering together of his people around his word and table. Oh yes, it's been a very long and torturous Lent. It wasn't because we gave up more than we could or should have, but because it was not given up at all. It was taken. That's how it feels. And then in exchange, we live in the tension of our fears, hoping against hope for the day when the threat will finally come to an end, but we're not sure. We're not sure if life will ever return to where it was, to whatever normal it is. Churches have been shuttered and we've been learning to watch worship as if that were maybe the new normal. And the sacrifices that we've made have also tempted us to think that we've suffered more than many before us. We struggle. We struggle to see God in the shadows of our fears. We struggle to find peace and rest as this nightmare continues to unfold around us. And in the end, it seems as it seems as if the church has become as weak as ever, hidden behind locked doors, stuck competing with the latest memes or cute videos to give relief or comfort to a people who only have screens left. Today, Jesus speaks. Peace be with you, he says. And with his words, his wounds, he enters our little locked rooms, those places where we hide from others in fear. Our sin does that. It isolates us. It estranges us. It divides us. It even sets us against one another. And we end up throwing the deadbolt on our lives, keeping the world away, and in the process, I'm afraid, keeping God away too. We're like Adam all over again, cowering in naked fear in the bushes, hiding. We won't step out. We're afraid to step out. The good news is Jesus steps in. He comes to us just as he came to those frightened disciples. And he speaks peace and shows the wounds that are our healing. Because that's where the joy is. In the words and in the wounds of Jesus, that's where the peace that passes our understanding is. It's in the wounds and the words of Jesus, and it's all here for you. And more. Again, Jesus says, peace be with you. Wasn't once enough? Why receive forgiveness when you've already been forgiven? Why look for peace a second time when you've already said it? Well, that's not the way faith speaks. Faith simply delights in whatever the Lord has to give. And hey, if he's giving out double peace on Easter, that's where I want to be. And so he breathed on them as he once breathed over the waters of in the beginning, as he once breathed into the nostrils of Adam, turning his lifeless clay into a living being. Breath and spirit are the same word in Greek, so in case you're thinking ahead of Pentecost, here's a preview. With Jesus' breath, words also come a 
the Holy Spirit. A little Pentecost, a preview of what's coming in 50 days from now. And in the process he sends them, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you, he says. Jesus, the Apostle of the Father, now is emboldening and empowering his disciples to be apostles, sent ones with his word and breath and spirit. He binds his mouth to theirs, his breath to their breath, his words to their words, with the announcement that your sins are forgiven. Absolution. Now there's uh, an interesting text history to this verse. It's rather revealing. Bible editors seem not to be able to agree on the tense of the verb here. Is it a past tense, a present tense, or a future tense? Is it to be rendered, the sins you forgive have been forgiven? Or the sins you forgive are forgiven? Or the sins you forgive will be forgiven? Which is it? Well, which would you rather have? Forgiveness, past, present, or future? How about all three? That's the faith we have it. Every way the Lord wants to give it. Past. The sins you forgive have been forgiven. Done to death on Calvary's cross. A done deal. Nothing more to add to Jesus' announcement that it is finished. Present. The sins you forgive are forgiven. Right here in your hearing, as we learn to say in the Catechism, from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting, but firmly believing that by it our sins are forgiven. Future. The sins you forgive will be forgiven on the last day, judgment day, when the Lord appears to judge the living and the dead. So, his word of forgiveness from the cross holds yesterday and today and forever. And then he warns, if that gift of forgiveness is refused, then whatever you retain is retained, because forgiveness is always rejectable, just as Jesus is always rejectable, but you do that at your own peril. Out of Jesus' death and resurrection flows the apostolic ministry and the apostolic church. And so he sends his disciples out as apostles for the express purpose of making forgiveness audible to those who have seen. That's why God sends pastors to his church. It's why God has a church in the first place. So that the forgiveness of sins would be preached and heard and believed and lived. You see, God doesn't care if you're entertained on a Sunday. He doesn't care if you feel spiritually uplifted, whatever that's supposed to mean. What he wants, more than anything else, is that you hear the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus' name, that you trust it, and that you live in fearless freedom as a result of it. He wants to give you something concrete and tangible to believe, something outside of yourself, namely, that Jesus died for your sins and that he was raised again for your justification. He wants to speak his peace into you and to display the wounds by which you are healed. Thomas, the twin, didn't get that opportunity the first Easter Sunday. We don't know where he was, we don't know what he was doing, maybe he was sulking or holding out, hiding out somewhere else, locked in his own upper room. But the next moment that the disciples saw him, they delivered what they had seen and heard. And unfortunately, or fortunately, Thomas refused to believe them. I don't think it's so much that he doubted. He's very plain about it. Unless I see the nail marks, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. That's not doubt, it's unbelief. And so the next week, a week later, the next Sunday, the disciples were again locked up in their little room, because after all, freedom is hard to get used to, isn't it? They still don't quite get it. They're still hiding, fearful, tentative. Like newly paroled prisoners, they're not quite sure what they should be doing. 
so I guess they feel it's safer to be locked up. But this time Thomas is with them. Again, Jesus appears out of nowhere speaking his peace and showing them his wounds. And then he zeroes in on Thomas. Go ahead, Thomas. Stick out your hand and see the nail marks and touch them. See that it's me. Put out your hand. Place it in my side. Don't be unbelieving, but believe. Trust me, Thomas. Trust my words to you. And the words of Jesus have their way with him. Because the next thing we hear is Thomas' confession of faith. My Lord and my God, much more than his eyes could ever have told him about Jesus. Faith trusts in the word, not in what you see. Faith comes by hearing, not by seeing. And we then walk by faith, not by sight. What Thomas saw? What he saw was the same Jesus who had been nailed to a cross, now tangibly, touchably risen from the dead. What Thomas believed was that this man named Jesus was his Lord and his God, his Creator and his Savior, the Christ and the Son of God. You know, now that I think about it, you and I have a, a real advantage over Thomas and the other disciples. Because there's nothing for us to distract our ears because there's nothing to see. And since faith comes by hearing, the church and her ministry really don't have to be anything much to look at. The crucified and risen Jesus, the one with the wounds, is our Lord and God too. And we don't need to see. And yet by that word and the Holy Spirit working in you through your baptism, you believe. That's the greater miracle. And he has a word for you, Jesus does. Bless it. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And you are blessed. You're blessed with a peace that can be found nowhere else but in the words of the wounds of Jesus who was sent to the cross to save you. You are blessed with Jesus' forgiveness. With the absolution spoken directly to you in the stead and by the command of Jesus himself. His spirited words breathing life and forgiveness and peace and joy into your death. You are blessed. Blessed with something far, far greater than the sight or even the touch of Jesus' hands and feet and side. You are blessed with his body and his blood, not to investigate like an unbelieving Thomas, but to eat and drink, trusting that these are for you and what a celebration that will be we once again will have the opportunity to come to his table and our Lord serve us with this precious fruit of his redeeming cross. Until then, you are blessed with the freedom to step out of whatever locked room you find yourself in. And however fearful your life may feel, and even when dismal unbelief seems to creep in on you, his words and his wounds will embolden and empower you to go out into the world and tell the good news of sins forgiven in the name of the crucified and risen Christ, so that you might invite all the unbelieving Thomases to come and hear for themselves that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, and he gives us his words and his wounds, his forgiveness and his peace. And we are very blessed. In the name of Jesus, amen. We continue with the prayer of the church. Hear us, merciful Father, as we pray for ourselves, for the church, for our nation, and for all conditions and manners of people. God of mercy, keep us from the doubts and fears that cripple us and prevent us from knowing the fullness of your saving peace and gracious presence. Teach us to trust in your word and to believe with all our hearts, minds, bodies, and strength in Jesus Christ, crucified for our sins and raised for our justification. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
God of grace, bestow upon your church your Holy Spirit and all the gifts that come down from on high. Grant to us faithful pastors to preach faithfully and ears to hear your word proclaimed. Give us boldness in our witness before the world and courage to speak your name without fear. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of power, give courage and strength to those persecuted for the faith and comfort the families of the martyrs. Keep your church from following the winds of change and make her steadfast in the doctrine of the apostles and the faith once delivered to the saints. Help us to admonish those who have fallen away from your word and to restore with gentleness those who have wandered from the truth. Lord, in your mercy, God of might, counsel the nations and their leaders in the paths of peace and justice. Bless us with wise and just leaders who will protect the sanctity of life and defend us against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Make us wise and discerning citizens to use the gift of liberty for noble purposes. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of love, teach us to love one another as you have loved us. Guide us so that in our neighborhoods and communities we may manifest the love of Christ as well as his strength. Deliver us from all that would threaten our homes and families. Protect police, firefighters, disaster relief workers, and medical personnel who will tend to us, as well as the places where we live and work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of comfort, give your aid and relief to all who suffer want or need, to the sick in their afflictions, to those troubled in mind, and to those to whom death draws near. Heal and sustain them according to your gracious will, and preserve them in faith to eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of hope be with those who grieve the loss of those whom they love. Point them to the promise of the resurrection and the gift of everlasting life to all who die in Christ. Deliver us from the distractions of things that do not matter, that we may focus on the needful things of your word and sacraments, and so be found faithful when our Lord returns in his glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, bless us with the good gifts of the earth, with the fruits of our honest labors, and with a kind and generous heart. Accept the worship of our hearts and voices, Walk with the tithes and offerings we bring as part of our gratitude and thanksgiving. Open our hearts and eyes to the needs of the poor, that we may serve them in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace, give harmony and unity to your people, both in our various vocations before the world and in our common life at this altar.